for life, but we're seeing that there are in some ways um, ways for new growth to be supporting um, those you know existing development, existing homes, um, and jobs by by allowing for transit to be more viable in some cases. So it's a theme that we're looking at. Um, another way of looking at transit, we have total homes um, in environmental justice areas near high frequency, high frequency transit. So these geographies that we used are, uh, they're based on the 2000 census, and so we know that those need to be updated. It's one of the metrics that we definitely need to be working on. So what we're showing you here, and I don't think we actually defined environmental justice before, and I'm sure most of you know it, but it is a federal um, definition that we're using for um, areas with high populations of low income and minority folks. So I just want to make sure I've got that covered. So we today have about 30% of homes in those areas with high quality transit access. The scenarios improve that, but really only incrementally from each other. So that's something that we're continuing to look at and struggling with. We're hoping that through this consortium, this grant process, that we can somehow try to get that number to, to move in a more positive direction. Okay. Another way that we look at transit for our MTP is um, the amount of transit costs which were covered through ticket sales is what this says, but uh, shorthand for those who are familiar with it would be fare box recovery. So we have some increasing budget um, going to transit in the three scenarios, but between those scenarios we actually have an even bigger increase in the hours of transit service, so um, how, how many hours there's actually a bus or train running. Um, because we're focusing in the scenarios more on higher, higher frequency in existing service areas. So while there is some bus expansion because you're just going to have you know, more, more growth, there's also this effort in the scenarios to focus on improving the transit service that's already there. So, and of course, right at this point, we're just hoping to improve to what it was a few years ago. So that's a challenge that we absolutely have to deal with um, in this plan of state. <coughs> And this is just following up on that, showing you what the results were showing. So you have, you know, you have um, a more productive investment basically going from, I mean, all three scenarios actually do very well. Um, as you see these, these percent returns, you're never gonna get a 100% return um, on, on the transit fare. But as you, as you go towards um, more, uh, you know, more uh, development that's clustered around transit, you know, more integration of those things, you get more people who can get onto transit, start riding it more, and you can see that you get more return here and it gets can get plowed back into the system. Okay, now I'm gonna add to transit um, biking walking. So this uh, metric is the share of trips taken by transit, biking, and walking, also known as the non-automotive share, for anybody who cares about that term. So we have increased development in centers and corridors. We have um, increased transit and complete street improvement or um, investment in um, pedestrian and bicycling infrastructure. And that leads to increased use of transit and walking and biking. So you have an increase in the amount of trips that are occurring um, by those modes. The number that you see on the screen um, are actually showing a percent increase from today. So we would love to get those types of mode shares, but we're working from a really small base of how many trips today are being taken by <laughs> biking and transit. Okay, vehicle miles traveled is the metric that Sago and Castro use and has been using for a very long time. Um, and we're looking in particular at vehicle miles traveled per household today. So in the scenarios in the future, um, these numbers go down. We have fewer miles being traveled by, um, by a person, by a household. And that is interestingly because one of the reasons for that is the total amount of travel time um, a person experiences on average in the car in these scenarios kind of decreases over time. Well, so why is that? Well, they're, they're, they're driving less um, because, as you, I told you, that in those scenarios you're seeing an increase in walking, biking, and transit. So they're driving less and they also are not having to drive as far because the land use pattern is having jobs and housing and shopping a bit more closer <coughs> together. So on average across the region, you see that the amount of time in cars is but interestingly, the total amount of time um, traveled by an average person increases a little bit because the more uh, transit, walking, and biking are slower modes, and so you take more time to do those things. So it's an interesting trade-off which you have to be um, considering between these three scenarios. Okay. All right, are you guys following me so far? I'm almost done. We're changing up the tape.
write your questions down. Please use for your acronyms. <laughs> I'm trying really hard, by the way. How am I doing? Oh, good. <laughs> Thanks. Well, while we're taking the tape, you can study this slide and then I don't have to talk about it. How does that sound like a deal? <laughs> now, um, very briefly, uh, so for SB 375, we do have to consider greenhouse gas emissions. We did receive a, a target from the California Air Resources Board that we are not required to achieve. It's actually a goal target, and so that's one of the reasons we are measuring these different scenarios against it. Um, ultimately, the plan that we adopt for the MTP has to represent um, both the, the revenue that's most likely to occur and the transportation system that's most likely to be funded by that for a development pattern that's most likely to occur. So if at the end of the day, it's realized that we cannot achieve that target, um, that's why we do all these different scenarios. Uh, we have other ways of showing how we could achieve that under the, bill, under the, the law, um, but it is not a requirement for us. Okay, I'm going to take this back around to the community types that I introduced to you um, two earlier. And I'm focused a lot on centers and corridors with you. Uh, that was not necessarily the focus in the workshops, but that's because one of the, your, um, um, the tasks for this grant is on the transit priority areas. The centers and corridors that I talk about here, they cover a, a much broader range than what would ultimately be the, the transit priority areas, because as I said, they're in some downtowns and some, you know, and some town centers that are, um, you know, are not going to have that level of transit in them. But a lot of those centers and corridors are in areas that are good candidates for transit priority area status. And so I'd like to just go to those community types to sort of show how centers and corridors um, perform from a travel perspective differently than other parts of the region. So this shows by scenario, and you don't really need to see the differences there, but you can see that as far as the share of trips by transit um, bike and walk, that there's a lot more of those kinds of trips that happen in centers and corridors. Maybe a no-brainer to some of you, and maybe that's new and interesting information. That would be good to know, actually. And then, on the other side of that, vehicle miles traveled is lower in centers and corridors um, because you've got more biking, walking, and transit trips occurring. And then finally, this is a metric that we've just been able to produce this for this transportation plan update. It's the total cost of transportation per household. So that includes auto ownership, auto use, and transit. Um, you know, the transit tickets for the passes. So the cost, um, the difference between the highest end, which is in rural residential communities, and centers and quarters is about $6,000 a year per household, which isn't, you know, that's like about $500 a month. It's a pretty big difference. And so that's one of the things that we are also considering, want others to consider um, as we go forward with this plan, as we go forward with this grant. So um, last, oh, and I'm supposed to tell you what came out of this workshop. So we asked people to tell us what their preferences were on scenarios, and the overwhelming results we got were for scenario three. We also received quite um, a strong minority interest in scenario two, and in some counties that was a majority interest. And so the recommendation that we um, gave to our board, and they did direct us to move forward in this direction, is to draft a preferred scenario that's somewhere between scenarios two and three. So that's what we're working on right now, to get something that performs um, in, that, in that vein. And as Joe said, the transit priority areas are not yet developed. It's something else that we're working on um, right now through the spring. So with that, I will ask if there are any